The motion on the Iraq inquiry. Mr. David Davis to move. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I beg to move the motion on the order paper in the names of the Honourable Member for Lewis, the Member for Leeds North West, myself, and a number of others. The Second Iraq War led to the deaths of over 4,800 Allied soldiers, 179 of them British. The lowest estimate of Iraqi civilian fatalities is 134,000 deaths. Plausible estimates put that number four times higher. So let's be clear. That is 134,000 innocent people, at least, who died. The war created 3.4 million refugees, half of whom fled the country. It cost the British taxpayer £9.6 billion, pounds, and it cost the American taxpayer $1,100 billion. It's an untold damage to the reputation of the West throughout the Middle East, and indeed amongst Muslim populations, both at home and abroad. Initiated to protect the West from terrorism, it has in fact destroyed the integrity of the Iraqi state and triggered a persistent civil war that has created the conditions for perhaps, perhaps the worst terrorist threat yet to the West, ISIL. And it's done huge harm to the self-confidence and unity of the West, neutering our foreign policy. The war was, with hindsight, the greatest foreign policy failure of this generation. And I say that as someone who voted for it. So that's why the Chilcot Inquiry was set up. The Iraq Inquiry was announced in 2009 with broad and proper terms of reference. Sir John Chilcot, the Inquiry's chairman, made it clear that this was principally about learning lessons. He said, these lessons will help ensure that, if we face similar situations in future, the government of the day is best equipped to respond to those situations in the most effective manner in the best interests of the country. Now, governments are often prompted by acts of terrorism into making mistakes. The US rushed into extraordinary rendition, torture, illegal surveillance in Guantanamo Bay. We uh, attempted to introduce 90-day detention without charge, which everybody now accepts was unnecessary and wrong. But the greatest and most dangerous errors are in foreign policy. As Lady Manningham Buller, the former head of MI5, stated, the invasion of Iraq undoubtedly increased the threat of terrorist attacks in Britain. Since the announcement of the inquiry, we've had three major foreign policy decisions that would have greatly benefited, benefited from the lessons that uh, uh, arose in the Iraq war. In Libya, we undertook a military intervention which is intended to prevent a massacre quite properly, was successful, but which was the precursor to protracted conflict and unrest following our nominal military victory. In Syria, the government was blocked by this House from military intervention, an intervention which would have led us to be uh, the supporters, the military supporters of our now uh, sworn enemies, ISIS. And now in Iraq, the UK has become embroiled in an ongoing civil war that's raged since the invasion in 2003. Uh, I will. Mr. Sp Mr Deputy Speaker, may I say that given the government's had, in my view, quite improperly, two statements on a backbench day, I'm going to have to limit my intervention, but I will give way to the other Very briefly, as someone who voted against Iraq and Libya. I can only concur with what my right honourable friend has said. But does he accept that the Chilcot inquiry has made it clear that they are, have cleared a lot of evidence for publication but have not published this evidence since 2012? And would it not be right, in the absence of the report itself, to at least get the evidence published, which would be the next best thing? Well, I think he makes a good point, and I'm going to refer in a minute to the Winograd report, which actually produced an interim report before the final report. I, either of those approaches would have been sensible and worthwhile, and indeed are still possible, in my view, are still possible. Now, when the sorts of decisions we made in uh, <coughs> Libya, Syria, Iraq are made without the knowledge of all the facts, mistakes are made, and sometimes people die as a result. So it's not hyperbole to say that the delay to the Iraq inquiry could actually cost lives because of bad decisions. When it was announced in 2009, the inquiry was expected to take one year, and that was thought by the then Leader of the Opposition to be too long. Had the inquiry stuck to this timetable, the Government would have had the benefit in all of these actions of any lessons that may be learned from the final report. Six years on from the start, Sir John Chilcott has said that the report has taken, and I quote, longer than any of us expected would be necessary. Possibly, uh, if, I, if you forgive me, I won't for the moment. Uh, 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 perhaps the understatement of the decade. 
There have been attempts to claim this is not an unreasonable period of time for such an important inquiry. But the Franks report on the Falklands War took six months. And we, we shouldn't forget that that war had a controversial start. It had controversial aspects to the continuing diplomatic negotiations. It was incredibly sensitive in, in diplomatic, national security, military and espionage terms. Uh, and yet it took six months. The Winograd Commission, the Israeli government appointed commission of inquiry into the war in Lebanon in 2006, is another relevant example. The commission held its first session in, in September 2006, released a preliminary report within seven months, uh, and then published uh, in January 2008, less than a year and a half after the inquiry was announced. And any argument for delay on the grounds of political sensitivity or national security will be far more pertinent in Israel, where the immediate threat to life is considerably greater than in any other country in the world. So with this, uh, I will give way very briefly to my right honourable friend. By the time we actually get to see this report, we will be in the third parliament during which it is being written and considered. Is my right honourable friend aware of any precedent for this whatsoever? And is there any possible legitimate excuse for it? No, that is, that is the case I'm going to explore. I'm not going to do what the Father House did and go back to the Dardanelles, but uh, you, have to get, you have to go back further than that, and even then you don't get to, to, to this level of delay. And indeed, I've been asked by... An, in fact, I'll give way to your... Does the Honourable Gentleman still want to intervene on me? Very quickly. Please. To have his response to uh, a statement by Jeremy Hayward take two days ago, in which he was said, uh, would he approve of the possibility of this House subpoenaing the evidence of Chilcot and publish it ourselves? His comment was, he doesn't want to rush the Chilcot report. Is that a reasonable view? I think it, when he listens to what I say shortly, he'll realise that uh, Mr. Hayward, uh, Sir Jeremy Hayward, certainly doesn't want to rush the, uh, the uh, uh, report, and there are some reasons for that, uh, which I don't approve of. Uh, I've been asked by a number of colleagues if I, why I believe this delay has occurred. The truth is, actually, no one in this House knows, not even the Minister. There's not enough information in the public domain, which is why this motion requires an answer to that question, that exact question, from Sir John Chilcott. Nevertheless, there are some clues. And for clarity, I should say I do not believe, at this stage at least, that the witnesses are the cause of this delay. And I say that because I think one of them will be speaking uh, uh, later. Some of the delay is undoubtedly down to the conflict between the inquiry and Whitehall, Sir Jeremy Hayward and others, uh, over what can and cannot be disclosed. What the inquiry can publish is wrapped up in a series of protocols which have criteria so broad that a veto on publication can virtually be applied at Whitehall's discretion. Compare this with a Scott inquiry into the Iraqi supergun affair, also covered issues of incredible levels of sensitivity in terms of national security, international relations, intelligence agency involvement, judicial propriety and ministerial decision making. Sir Richard Scott was allowed to decide by himself what he would release into the public domain, unfettered by Whitehall, unfettered by Whitehall. By contrast, Sir John Chilcott, who's a past Northern Ireland secretary, a uh, permanent secretary, who's chaired an incredibly sensitive uh, inquiry into intercept evidence and who's considered uh, a responsible keeper of government secrets, is tied up in protocols subject to the whim of Whitehall. And now we know there have been long negotiations between the inquiry and Sir Jeremy Haywood and his, uh, the Cabinet Secretary and his predecessors over the disclosure of some material, most notably correspondence between the ex-Prime Minister Tony Blair and George W. Bush. Now there is no point in this inquiry whatsoever if it cannot publish the documents that show how the decision to go to war was arrived at. Chilcott himself wrote in a letter to the Cabinet Secretary, quotes, the question when and how the Prime Minister made commitments to the United States about the UK's involvement in military action in Iraq and subsequent decisions on the UK's continuing involvement is central to its considerations. <laughs> Now, the negotiations between Chilcott and uh, Jeremy Haywood only concluded in May last year, when it was announced that an agreement had been reached. The process was clearly frustrating for the inquiry. Sir John Chilcott inquired, queried why it was that individuals may disclose privileged information without sanction, whilst a committee of privy councillors established by a former Prime Minister cannot. 
He was referring, of course, to Alistair Campbell and Jonathan Powell's respective diaries, which uh, did quote such information. Uh, as John, and then Sir John Chilcott said in the letter that documents vital to the public understanding of the inquiry's conclusions are being suppressed by Whitehall. Now, this is ridiculous. Uh, if that's going to be the approach, then nothing will be learned and there is little purpose in this inquiry at all. The inquiry protocols are symptomatic of a mindset that seems to assume that serving civil servants are the only proper guardians of the public interest. And that leads me to a particular problem here. If a minister is asked to make a decision which affects him, or affects his family, or affects his property, or even affects his constituency, he is required to withdraw in the jargon to recuse himself from the decision and have somebody else make it. That doesn't say the minister's corrupt. It just means that you can avoid the appearance of corruption, you can avoid uh, the, uh, any chance of improper decision, and it removes the risk of unconscious bias. It's a proper procedure. No such rule applies for civil servants. This inquiry process is littered with people who are central to the very decisions the inquiry is investigating. Sir Jeremy Hayward was uh, Principal Private Secretary to Tony Blair for the entire period from the 9-11 uh, atrocity through to the first stage of the Gulf War. Yet he's Whitehall's gatekeeper as to what can and cannot be published. Even the head of the Inquiry Secretariat, Margaret Aldred, was a deputy head of the Foreign and Defence Policy Secretariat and therefore responsible for providing ministers with advice on defence and policy matters on Iraq and she was nominated to the inquiry by the Cabinet Secretary of the day. Now, all of this would matter less if these ridiculous, restrictive protocols that Whitehall's imposed on the Chilcot inquiry were not there. Like Scott, Sir John Chilcot should be allowed to publish what he thinks is in the public interest and not what Whitehall thinks is acceptable. Uh, will you forgive me? I'm, I'm now making... I know he does, but I'm, I'm making progress. If that... No. If that had uh, been the case, say, if that had been the case, you know we might say. well have had the inquiry report already, and there would be less public concern about an establishment cover-up. We also know that the maximisation process is causing some delay. Those who be criticised in the final report are being allowed lengthy legal consultation. Whilst it's a necessary part of the process, there need to be strict time controls. It cannot be right that those who are due to be criticised can delay publication for their own benefit. Let me finally deal with the issue of preventing publication during the run-up to the general election. Perda periods exist for a simple reason, to prevent governments from using their power to publish information that would give them electoral advantage. They are not to prevent impartial information from being put in the public domain. So why delay a deliberately impartial report of vital interest to the nation just because the election is pending. It's nonsense. And it's not clear, frankly, I say to those who are cheering, that there will be much political advantage anywhere in this. It was started by a Labour government, right, but it was supported by the current Prime Minister, who spoke in favour of it even as late as 2006. The current Labour leader did not vote for it because he was not in the House. So you know, there, is, there is a complete confusion as to where any advantage is this. But the public interest should trump any interest of party advantage here. Uh, and that's why it should not be delayed for that reason. The Iraq inquiry has been a missed opportunity. Terrible mistakes were made, but fatally we have so far failed to learn our proper lessons from them. Douglas Hurd, the former f Foreign Secretary, and in no way an anti-establishment figure, has branded the endless delays as a scandal. He is right. It's a disgrace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an insult to those who died yeah, yeah. on our behalf uh, in that war. It's a betrayal of the people they died to protect. That's why I asked this House to pass this motion today. Yeah, yeah, yeah.